Okay, well, let's go ahead and um, call to order uh, the interim meeting of the uh, Incor Property and Casualty Committee. Um, at this time, we'll ask Will to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, starting with uh, committee members who have registered, uh, Assemblyman Ken Cooley. Here. Uh, Representative Brian Loesch. Representative Terry Austin. Representative Matt Lehman. Here. Representative Joe Fisher. Here. Representative Deanna Frazier Gordon. Here. Representative Derek Lewis. Here. Representative Edmund Jordan. Senator Robert Mills. Present. Representative Brenda Carter. I do, she, I saw her here. Maybe she's on mute, so I won't mark. Okay. Uh, Senator Walter Michelle. Here. Senator Neil Breslin. Representative Lacey Hull. Senator Mary Felskowski. Delegate Steve Westfall. Here, I'm here. Okay, and uh, non-committee members who have registered, uh, Representative Deborah Ferguson. Here. Representative Tammy Nuccio. Representative Jim Gooch. Uh, Tammy, Tammy Nuccio is here also. Great, thank you, Representative. And Representative Jim Gooch is here. Uh, Representative Rachel Roberts. Representative Poppy Arford. And Representative Wendy Thomas. Here. Okay, are there any other legislators present that I did not call? Yeah, this okay, is Representative Jonathan Carroll. I'm sorry, this is Representative Jonathan Carroll from Illinois. I did register for this, now I am on the committee, I believe. And yes, thank you, you Representative Carroll. And you also have Representative yep. Brenda Carter. Thank you, Brenda. Representative Rowland's here as well. Yes, yeah, Chair Rowland. <laughs> um, noted. And we will have, uh, we will need a motion uh, to waive the quorum, Mr. Chairman. You know, I think we have a quorum of the Kentucky Banking and Insurance Committee. Does that help? <laughs> you know, it's funny, Bart. I just checked to see if we had a vote scheduled because we actually have a rule somewhere about no more than, you know, five or six, whatever it is, people from the same state can participate in any vote. You really packed this meeting. So I will make that motion to waive the quorum requirement. We need a second. Second. We have a motion from Assemblyman Cooley, a second from Representative Frazier. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Right. And the quorum is waived. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning and thanks uh, to everyone for joining this meeting today. I know that everyone is very busy and I appreciate uh, your time and participation. Uh, the purpose of today's meeting is for the committee to conduct some business in advance of the July meeting in New Jersey so that the committee is able to handle all of the issues on its New Jersey agenda in a timely manner. Uh, this committee has a lot of work to do over the next several months, so I asked to call this interim meeting because I wanted to make sure that when the committee reaches a point of finishing its work on the issues that were not pressed for time and people do not feel unduly rushed. We'll get started today uh, with an update on the development of the MCOR Delivery Network Model Act. Uh, we started talking about this on a Zoom meeting in February. Uh, it set the table for a discussion uh, in March when we were uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, after that, <coughs> we'll continue discussion on the NCOR Insurance Underwriting Transparency Model Act that's sponsored by Indiana Representative Matt Lehman, uh, two-time reigning immediate past president of NCOR. Uh, similar to our DNC model, uh, we had a good discussion on that on the Zoom meeting in February, talked again about it in Las Vegas at a March meeting, and hopefully we'll get some good feedback for Representative Lehman today. Uh, lastly, we'll provide an update for comment and discussion on the five NCOL model acts that are scheduled for readoption. Uh, per the NCOL bylaws, all model acts are scheduled to be reconsidered for readoption every five years. Uh, if a model is not readopted, it sunsets. 
Uh, I, will, I will note today that the models will not be voted on for readoption today. Rather, this will be an opportunity for comment and discussion uh, in advance of the summer meeting where the actual vote will take place. Uh, the agenda will prob probably in July will be pretty full. So we, there will not likely be any time for additional discussion at the July meeting. Uh, we would like to have discussion on the readoption of those models today and then hold the vote at the end of the committee meeting in July. Uh, so that's going to be our agenda today, and we'll go ahead and get started with the first item on the agenda, uh, which, which is continued discussion on development of NCOIL Delivery Network Company Model Act. Uh, before we get started, uh, I will announce, and probably no surprise to everyone on the committee, that I will be sponsoring this model uh, and attempting to oversee its development until it crosses the finish line uh, this November. Uh, and I say November for a couple of reasons. First, it follows the unofficial but generally followed in coal timeline of developing and adopting a model within a calendar year. And then secondly, as most of you know by now, I am not running for re-election. So this will be my last year in the Kentucky General Assembly and also my last year uh, as a member of NCOL. Uh, third, this issue is extremely important. It's timely as many states are going to be looking to enact legislation on this very soon. Uh, according, accordingly, similar to how this committee acted quickly and decisively with adopting a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing model act to provide states guidance on an emerging issue. It's important that we do so again so the states have a model ready next year uh, when it's time for them to go into their sessions. This is a great opportunity for NCOL to again be a leader on an important issue and I'm confident that we will accomplish the task at hand. Uh, we are encouraged so far by the dialogue that's been ongoing among key interested parties. I know there's been an informal working group uh, that has met a couple of times and it's great to know that there's a lot of important voices engaging on this issue. Uh, some of those that have been involved are Uber, Lyft, APCIA, DoorDash, UPS, Amazon, Shipt, Instacart, Shelter Insurance, Buckle, and Namit. So look forward to hearing comments from everyone today as to how the model should be developed so that we can have a solid first draft ready uh, for inclusion in the 30-day meeting materials. Uh, let's go ahead now at this time and hear from uh, any interested parties that we have online uh, who may want to talk about the upcoming model. Mr. Chairman, I can I can make some brief comments if you're okay. Yes, sir, Brad, go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, you you've summarized the uh, the sort of the stakeholder meetings that we've engaged the participants in the stakeholder meetings. Uh, so far, and I think they've been very productive. Uh, we, we're accounting for all the different business models uh, where personal autos are uh, that are normally insured under a personal auto policy are used to make delivery commercially. So that's been uh, a focus of the discussion is fleshing all those out. It's not not limited to just on demand food delivery from restaurants. It, it goes a little beyond that. So I think we'll, we're going to be borrowing from the TNC and the P2P, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, car rental models where appropriate since both of those involve the use of personal autos in a commercial context. Uh, but everyone I think acknowledges that there are going to be some differences uh, between them. Um, you know, we, uh, we've started with first drafts of, of hey, language that uh, Uber and uh, APCIA to give us something to, to work off of. And we're currently circulating uh, more ideas on language uh, following the first couple of okay. discussions. Navajo uh, Nation Division um, of Natural we, Resources. We uh, would like to continue the discussions uh, to achieve okay. consensus. Okay, as great. As Alrighty, cool. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, hey, lady, lady, you're on. at the mute, please. So I was just saying we'd like to continue the discussions to try to con achieve consensus as much as possible going into the July meeting and then prepared to continue to work on the outstanding issues from there on. All right. Thank you, Brad. And thank you for t participating in the meeting so far and for your input. Um, any other inter interested parties online? Uh, Frank, do you have your hand raised? I do, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you very much. I just want to uh, re reiterate uh, what Brad had to say, that uh, all of the parties of interest are represented in these discussions. We've had uh, two conversations. A third is upcoming. Uh, we are heading in the right direction. And one of the things that I would say is the fact that most of the people on this group have worked on prior 
and coil related sharing economy models. So there's familiarity with each other and with the issues that each party brings to the table. So for our part, APCIA is, is quite optimistic that we will be able to bring to NCOIL and to you, Mr. Chairman, as a sponsor, uh, a model that uh, will have widespread agreement. Thank you, Frank. Um, one item that's been pointed out to me that we might want to clarify in the definition section uh, of the bill when it's drafted is to just say, instead of a personal vehicle for delivery, say a network device, maybe so we're not, you know, maybe this is not, make sure our bill is not applying to someone who's delivering drugs from a pharmacy or the local pizza delivery um, place. If there's a way to, uh, to distinguish that in our definition sections, if you all just give some thought about that. Uh, next, interested parties. Mr. Chairman, I'll go next if you don't have yes, some. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, John Schnauz with NAMIC. Just briefly, I'll echo what was said by the two previous speakers. And then, Mr. Chairman, to the concern you or the issue you just stated, um, maybe to briefly outline a couple of points where there may be a, a divergence or some new language needed from the TNC model. Um, one of the issues we've been trying to discuss is how this model would dovetail with existing state regulations on deliveries, which in the grand scheme of things, there obviously could be uh, for certain kinds of, of products. Um, I guess briefly, the other two issues that I think we've spent most of our time talking about are what the start time would be for these. If you recall the TNC model, there's a, a log on sort of trigger log on to the app, and that may or may not be the appropriate sort of thing to use here. And then finally, uh, coverage minimums. I think that's sort of the other issue where we're trying to reach consensus. Haven't quite gotten there yet, but as the previous folks said, optimistic that we will. Thank you. We have anyone else that would like to comment um, as an interested party at this point? If not, we can move on to any legislators either on the committee or participating um, and not on the committee. Any comments? <clears throat> Will, do you have any, any messages from anyone wanted, else wanting to comment? No, we did not receive uh, any requests in advance and I, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. All right, well, my hope is that uh, the group will continue to keep working uh, together uh, unofficially until we meet again officially in July. Uh, and, and if you have any comments or any thoughts, if you can put those in writing the wheel, that certainly would be helpful in advance of, uh, in advance of our July meeting. Uh, and before we move on, just to sponsor the model and chair this committee, just some, some thoughts that I have on kind of where we should go with this. Uh, you know, I don't see how we could possibly have a DNC model that's wildly different from state to state. Uh, so just some thoughts for you all to kind of think on till we meet again. Um, should we include uninsured and underinsured motorist coverage uh, and kind of set the levels of coverage requirements uh, across uh, in our model rather than just saying minim the, uh, the minimum financial requirements of each state? Uh, in Kentucky, our we just increased the property damage limit a couple sessions ago. So now we're at 25, 50, 25. Um, maybe, uh, maybe Will could, could get together for us some, um, what those limits are from state to state. And we could, we could possibly pick a good number there uh, that makes sense. Uh, and then secondly, there's been some discussion about an exemption uh, from the model for commercial coverage if it's vegan salt. Um, and then, should we have, should that exemption be subject to scenarios where the commercial coverage limits has limits that satisfy the requirements of the model as well? So just, just some things that we'll throw out there for possible discussion and thought. And uh, if you folks in the working group could kind of digest that a little bit and, and get back to us with your thoughts around those couple of items, uh, it would be helpful before July. Uh, we'll move on to our second item. Uh, and that is the continued discussion on NCOIL Insurance uh, Underwriting Transparency Model Act. Uh, the sponsor is going to be Representative Matt Lehman, uh, NCOIL past president. Um, Representative Lehman, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on a personal note, I'll say I'm sorry to see you 
uh, heading for the exit. I, I, it's always good to have uh, insurance people making insurance laws. So you will be missed, but uh, understand completely. So I want to thank you, first of all, for bringing this up today on your, on your meeting. Um, I want to also comment, I don't know who all is on this call today, but I know many of you have reached out uh, to me with some thoughts, and I really appreciate all that. So I want to thank you for your engagement in this. Uh, and before I walk through the model, just to kind of lay out some groundwork here, um, similar to what Chairman Rowland said is, I, I think this is an issue we need to keep moving forward on. Uh, my target is still to try to have something in place here by the November meeting so that if, if we take these back to our states, we're, we're within that time frame of getting bills drafted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my goal is still a November uh, date on this and to continue to work with the industry and interested parties as we move forward. Um, I think this issue has gained some momentum. Um, I've heard from several people within the trades. Um, I think you saw what the NEIC has done, what they're doing. I think you saw what happened in Washington State. Um, with their regulatory answers. So I think it, it's, it's a timely issue that we need to keep talking about. Um, so as, as we move through this, I want you all to understand that you know, none of this is, is, is carved in stone. Uh, this model is not a take it or leave it approach. Uh, there's been a lot of good input. <clears throat> so I wanna continue those conversations with those interested parties and legislators. Uh, more happy to have you engaged in this obviously as well since you are the, the, the tip of the spear on this. Um, so there's been several things I'm just going to kind of go through the, the notes I've made on, on my model uh, that I've heard from the industry. I've heard some people and I, I get your input and, and you know, time, time my thinking. Um, first of all, in the definition section, we talk about an adverse action. Uh, there's been some discussion on what defines an adverse action. Um, should that be around a percentage of an increase? So if a carrier takes a 2% increase, is that considered adverse? Uh, a lot of states have some thresholds, anything, you know, 10% or more type of thing. So maybe that 10% is where we start our conversation. Um, so I, again, that, none of this is, is out there as, 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 uh, as, as, you know, unnegotiable, but I think that it's a fair issue that was brought up on the definition of an adverse action. It needs to be more than just a simple carrier took a rate increase. Uh, maybe they took across the board rate increase. We're really trying to focus again on that piece of the puzzle that is that my rate's being affected by when it comes to this collection of data. Um, the next thing is, I think uh, I've had a lot of say, you know, we want to make sure to stay focused on um, personal lines, insurance, home and auto, and maybe some other things around that personal lines. Um, I agree. I think I, I think it says here underwriting of personal insurance, but let's maybe make that clear. So maybe some wordsmithing there. Uh, to get us to where this does really only apply to personalized type policies. Um, there was some discussion around the applying this to renewals or new. We talk in here about on the adverse about a denial. I still want to continue that conversation. I think that if I, you came in my office today and I said, here's your new premium with this carrier or that carrier, and you choose, that you're choosing that premium as it is right now. And there really would be no, no disclosure necessary of what data was used, et cetera, because you can choose what you want to do. This is more on, on that policy, the actual renewal. When that renewal comes in a year from now and it went up, you know, 18%, I can't explain at all why it went up 18%. That's the issue I think we're around here. But on the, on the issuing side, if I'm denied a policy, and we do have that, some carriers just say, hey, that they're not eligible. If that eligibility is based on those tangible things, which has always been your driving records crappy, you've been, you know, you hit 10 people last year with your car. Those are things, again, we would say that that's, I can disclose that and say, you can't get insurance with this company because of these things. So somewhere in that, we need to maybe continue to have some discussion around that denial piece. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the next one is on the definition of external data. Uh, there was some conversation around that. Uh, what is supplemental data from a third party vendor? Like I'm gathering information regarding maybe your social media. Uh, maybe I'm gathering information um, from those, uh, uh, you know, really the things that we just don't really know right now, it's inside that black box. But there are things that companies use their external data when it comes to like flood maps or ISO ratings, uh, things like that that aren't necessarily, if, if an ISO rating uh, changes, you know, and that creates a change, does that trigger 
a disclosure. So I think we need to have some discussion around some of that uh, definition of, of, of external data. Again, maybe just some wordsmithing on that. Um, when we get into section three on the transparency requirements, um, the, one of the discussions is around the, num the number. The, you know, we have in the draft, you know, 10, should it be, you know, 15, should it be five, should it be four? I mean, what number should that be? And I think we can continue that discussion, but I do think there needs to be enough there that the client uh, or the broker can extrapolate out really what was the dr those driving factors that created that additional that additional premium. Um, we talk about, uh, um, let me see here, what are some other notes? Uh, we talk about the issues around underwriting and rating of risk, uh, the definition. Uh, some data might be used from an underwriting standpoint. Some might be used more to actually calculate a rate. Again, those are things I'm willing to have that discussion on as to, uh, you know, uh, recognize what those realities are, what really is going into, again, this transparency uh, to the client for understanding. Um, there was some discussion around this whole, and I think this is kind of made a linchpin of this whole model is the disclosure. Um, and I've, I've heard from several in the industry that have said, you know, we, we've got to be very sensitive to the fact that uh, some of this is proprietary. Uh, maybe we have found, we have our secret sauce, you might say, that uh, we hold very near and dear to us. We don't want that to be disclosed. We don't want that to get out to the competitor, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a so I think we've got to be careful on how do we protect that at the same time, uh, still move forward with the fact that I think this has to be disclosed to the, to the inquiring client with that rate increase. Um, is that something that can be worked through a, a broker? You know, because we're contracted already to hold those things in confidence, uh, or is it, you know you got a lot of people who buy direct, so that that is an issue. I think we still have to work through um, on that piece. Um, and then I think lastly, um, it might be that uh, this this on this some of these pieces, like I said, we're going to talk about. But I think the the biggest thing I've heard from the industry is just the quote unquote almost the impossibility of transmitting this amount of, this amount of data. Uh, everybody's gonna be unique. If there's 50 people on this call, we may have 50 different matrices that were used to calculate our premiums. How, would, how do you disclose that to 50 different people? Um, we gotta figure out a way because I think it comes down to, uh, there's one thing if we, if we can't do it to try to find that way versus we just don't wanna do it. Um, it's been interesting, several I've talked to have said, you know, we, we wanna engage, we just don't know yet where all this is gonna end up. We don't know what we can share, what we can't share. So I think I wanna keep moving forward, but again, the, because this is referenced as a, as a transparency model, none of this is saying we're gonna prohibit like Washington State did. We're gonna to move to some prohibition on use of, 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 of external data, you know, but we're also public policymakers. I mean, the people on this call that are representatives and, and senators, we have, a, we have an obligation to our constituents to make sure that what the industry is using in that data is good public policy and, and is actuarially, you can make that argument. And that's been happening for the years. And I, I don't think anything nefarious is going on. In fact, uh, that was brought up in a question in a meeting and I said, absolutely not. I don't think anything's being done that would cross that line. We just wanna make sure that we're as public policymakers understanding what's going into these that, 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 that make this an actuarially and an insurance driven uh, product. So kind of all that said, uh, you know, we've gotten some feedback with like more feedback. Again, a lot of this is around maybe the wordsmithing, but the one thing I think we're gonna have to really get our handle on and work together on is going to be on that disclosure of that, of the, the true transparency of this model. And so uh, I'd love for you to reach out to me, reach out to NCOL staff, I've had a couple people inquire as to, you know, can, can we share some things that might be proprietary in our discussion, but we don't want necessarily maybe bring that up at a, at a, at a big meeting. So, you know, we're willing to sit down with, with people and, and try to figure out a way to, to have this dialogue um, that maybe we don't, uh, we don't have, uh, you know, some, some confidentiality around. Um, but I, I do think I want to continue, Mr. Chairman, moving forward with this, and I'm looking forward to input uh, from people. 
Um, and I know as you have with your own model, um, you know, if you've got questions, as Mark said, you know, send them to him, send them to NCOL staff, uh, send them to me, and I'll be more happy to continue these discussions. But like I said, I've gotten some good input from some. Um, we've got a draft from one uh, trade that, you know, it, it, it's got a lot of potential. Um, but again, we still have to get around that transparency. And that's kind of one of the, I don't want to say the hard line in the sand, but the one that we need to really stay focused on is how are we disclosing this and being transparent to our clients, uh, to our constituents, to our clients, um, when they ask that question of why am I getting this increase? And, and today it's just difficult to answer that question. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you and uh, be happy to answer any questions or, or I've got my pen ready to take some notes on some input. All right, thank All right. you very much. Do we have um, interested parties at this time that would like to make comments? Uh, Andrew, I believe I see you with your hand raised. You're recognized to comment on uh, the proposed model. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Andrew Kirkner with NAMIC. I uh, would we'll just uh, sort of reiterate uh, some of the comments of the sponsor and thank him. Um, you know, our Members, I think this the introduction of this model has been a, a really good uh, launch point for discussion inside of our membership, um, where I've learned a lot about this issue candidly, uh, and learned a lot about what companies are already doing and, and kind of the way uh, they conceptualize uh, this issue. So I would start by saying, you know, we've had really positive feedback from our members. They understand uh, the desire to see uh, some increased information to consumers. Um, you know, from an insurance company's perspective, you want to keep consumers, right? You want to write business. Uh, you want to have folks in the door. And so there's not, um, this is one of those areas where there's not a, a conflicting desire on behalf of the insurer and the consumer um, from a 10,000 foot perspective, right? Uh, and so our, our members really are looking at this as a customer service issue. Um, I'll, I'll go down. We do have some concerns about the draft as it's been introduced. And I'll be pretty brief because uh, Rep. Layman went through most of the, the points kind of of contention, so I don't I don't want to belabor those. I would I would just say you know we really our, our members really firmly believe that the uh, adverse action as it's defined in this bill is really too broad. Um, if if the goal of this bill is to tell consumers why they've seen a significant premium increase or why they've been denied coverage, um, we think there's a much more narrowly tailored way to do that. Uh, whether it's to to establish a threshold. Uh, like like uh, was was just spoken about, um, or whether there's some other trigger, we think that 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 language could be tightened up somewhat. Um, I think uh, you know, kind of getting right to the heart of the matter. The question really is around the primary factors used language, and I would make it. May, I would maybe refine that even a little bit further. The the uh, draft as introduced would require insurers to um, disclose all primary factors up to ten. Um, that is concerning uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there is, as was mentioned, uh, a logistical problem. So let's say that whatever trigger is established, if it's 10%, um, you know, you could have an across the board, every policyholder in a state, 11% increase, and then you may have 20 or 30,000 policyholders that would, under the, the terms of the, the draft as introduced, uh, be uh, do uh, uh, one of these notices, right? So that's sort of a, a logistical issue. That's probably, to Rep. Layman's point, a question of, of uh, uh, resources and uh, uh, desire versus ability. Uh, I think that'd be a, a fair statement. But it does, it does become a little bit more than that when we start talking about some competitive issues. Uh, and here I'd point to Section 3A, which would require uh, a disclosure of all primary factors um, you know, when, when, it, when an insurer uses external data. Um, that, that's concerning to us for any number of reasons, but it's not very hard to envision a scenario uh, in a fiercely competitive industry, I might, might add, uh, where insurer A would, would sort of mine insurer B uh, for what the primary factors they're using uh, might be. Uh, and so we have concerns. Obviously, we're a trade association comprised of many members. Uh, and so we're concerned about that, uh, both from a small company perspective and a large company perspective, candidly. Um, so I don't think 
we, you know, we have some suggestions. Uh, we, we've certainly had a number of conversations with stakeholders and, and produced a draft. And we think there is potential to continue the conversation. And, and I do think we share the goal of transparency. I think from our perspective, we just wanna make sure that there are guardrails around uh, proprietary information and then making sure we're balancing uh, a consumer's uh, ability to learn more about their insurance rating uh, and uh, and also not making uh, the costs of said uh, knowledge so high that it that it ultimately has a negative impact on consumers. So I'll I'll wrap up my my comments here. I'm happy to try to answer any questions, but we really appreciate uh, both the sponsor and uh, Inquil staffs uh, working uh, through this issue uh, and look forward to continuing to participate in the discussion. Thanks, Andrew. Um, other interested parties or persons on the call. Uh, that would like uh, to make comments. Seeing none at this time, we'll move along to uh, legislators. I'll recognize our president, uh, Assemblyman Cooley, first for comments. Uh, thank you, Bart. Yeah, I just, Andrew, I want to thank you for your comments, Matt. That was a very excellent summary. Um, you know, I think things like this are they're hard conversations to have, but I just note we're, we're very fortunate to be able to have this conversation in the context of an organization like Incoil. Of course, I come out of California and um, in California, we have the crazy ballot proposition process where if an idea takes root, you have no idea where it's going. Of course, that was our big insurance wars in 1980 and $50 million spent and uh, dramatic change in the marketplace just because some idea appealed to the public. And uh, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way. It's just, it's like, that's how things can lurch in dramatic directions. So Andrew, I appreciate your comments. I do think something like this, we, we sort of roll up our sleeves and just try to work through the issues and include everybody at the table and I do think having everybody at the table is so important. We just did the transparency, the, the uh, DNC Act. And of course we had DoorDash submitted a letter pointing out that not every one of these companies has passengers. And so whatever we do in that area, we need to acknowledge that little nuance. So I just wanna thank everyone for their participation. And um, because we do know that uh, there's much more opportunity to in a collegial way, have serious conversations and try to knock the burrs off a, a set of ideas as working together in incoil be, before it sort of jumps out into some other form and gets wound up uh, without the reflection and measured judgment that we typically strive for. So thank you, Matt. And thank you all in the industry that's participating in the conversation. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Any other legislators on the call uh, who have comments at this time? Chairman Rowland, this is Wes Fisk with the Big Eye. I'm obviously not a legislator, but was slow on my mute button before if you're still willing to take comments from an interested party. Yeah, Wes, you're recognized. Time. Go ahead. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Sorry, uh, sorry for that. Um, on behalf of the Big Eye, the Independent Insurance Agents of Workers of America, I'll just say we are very supportive of this model. We think that Representative Lehman has identified an issue that, that, that definitely needs to be addressed uh, by legislation or, or regulation. It, 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 it addresses an increasingly common situation where uh, with increasingly complex models, rates will go up at, to a certain degree um, that just sort of defy common sense. There's an output from these models that, that the agent can't explain. It's got the customer kind of scratching their head um, there's no real confidence when you then go to the company and the company frontline people can't explain it. So we've got a situation where um, in some cases this is increasing and there's a lack of confidence, a lack of confidence um, that's sort of uh, building um, a as a result. That's, that's incredibly uh, unfortunate. Um, I think, you know, we've heard from the sponsor, there are a number of issues that he and, and others are looking at. We think that, you know, figuring out the, the scope and the tr appropriate trigger for the model um, makes sense. We, we would be worried, though, if this got watered down to, to an extent that it wasn't um, meaningful. We, we do worry to some extent that this could be, you know, the ultimate proposal would be you have to disclose up to X number of factors 
that had an impact on the rating. And that, you know, when you say up to a certain number of factors, that could be one factor and you move on. So that that, that language has to be, I think, sorted out. Um, we do, in looking at the penalties provision, in our view, it does seem particularly punitive to uh, suggest that a violation of this, perhaps, you know, a, 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 a you know, well-intentioned effort to comply with the law and you maybe didn't technically do so, that that could result in a, in a violation of the Unfair Trade Practices Act. That seems uh, a, a little bit punitive for the companies who are arguing that they do need time to sort this out before, um, uh, before they could comply. Uh, maybe there does need to be a longer effective date than, than, than six months. Um, another thing we'd urge you to take a look at is, is in Section 3A, um, some of this information is only provided upon written requests, which seems a little bit formal. Uh, in 2022, so maybe just by request or in some other way, um, maybe things to think about it as well. And we, you know, I, we've had some back channel conversations with some of our insurer friends on this issue already. One, th one thing I'd point out though, is there is a precedent for this. Um, when in, in today's world under both state and federal law, if there's an adverse action that occurs as a result of someone's credit history, their credit information, companies are obligated to provide these very same notices today so what, I think what, what Representative Lehman is essentially saying is that, you know, it, it used to be the models were very credit centric, centric or credit focused. And as the, the, you know, as the marketplace has evolved and other criteria are being now considered, we've got to extend and, 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 uh, and enhance regulation uh, in the same way we need to, uh, to catch up. So um, we'd urge you to take action on this, you know, hopefully this year um, to not water it down too much. Um, and uh, we look, forward very much so in being part of the process going forward. We definitely want something that's workable uh, and not punitive to the insurer community, but this is an area where enhanced transparency would be uh, greatly appreciated by both agents and consumers. Thank you, Wes. <clears throat> Any other legislators or interested parties on the call that would like to make comments now? Uh, if not, I'll... Uh, Turn it back over to Representative Lehman to kind of wrap up this discussion. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, just a couple of, of comments, maybe. And <clears throat> I do appreciate the input, uh, uh, Andrew, on the on the use of the all uh, primary factors. That, that, that's kind of where I was going when I was talking about this, you know, little too much disclosure, maybe when it comes to proprietary uh, or trade secrets. Um, Wes, you make some good points on, on the punitive and, 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 and the effective date. Um, you know, as I've said multiple times at NCOIL, you know, we're, we're, we build the house and, and the states, you know, fill in the, you know, they, they, they furnish it. Um, I think that every state is going to be a little different. You may have some states that have already begun to take regulatory action. They may ramp this up quicker than others who have taken no action. So I think that this is a time to respond to this. And I think uh, those points are well taken. Um, and I look forward to continuing this. I think I maybe said at the beginning, you know, I, I, and I, I mean this seriously, reach out to me. I um, mean, easily accessible. Reach out to NCOIL. Tom and Will do such a great job. Um, you know, I, the chairman, you know, he's got enough. His hands are full with his own model act and, and, and wrapping everything up there. So, um, you know, if you have questions, reach out to, to Tom or to Will or to myself. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, bringing this up again and dealing with this when we get to uh, New Jersey. Thank you, Representative Lehman, and thank you to everyone uh, for their comments uh, on both the models. Uh, today is today valuable input to us um, as we're moving forward. Are there, any, are there any final comments from anyone? Okay, uh, not seeing any, we'll move on to our, our final item on the agenda, uh, which is the opportunity for comment or discussion on the NCOL model laws that are scheduled for readoption uh, at the NCOL summer meeting. Uh, we'll open it up for comments on the model laws that were listed on the agenda that's been provided to you, and we'll go in the order of the models as they were listed on the agenda. Uh, we'll ask for comments from both legislators and interested persons. So the first one would be uh, the Auto Insurance Fraud Model Act, originally adopted by NCOL July 22nd of 2006, readopted February of 2012, and again in July of 2017. Uh, it's up for readoption again this year. Do we have any comments from legislators? Bard, this is Ken Cooley. I'd like to make just a general comment. Yes, sir. You're recognized for that. Um, you know, I think the whole issue of having strong anti-fraud laws is extraordinarily important. 
in the insurance field. And it, it's sort of on my mind this year here in California from time to time has nothing to do with auto insurance. You, you've seen a lot of conversation around the whole notion of single payer health care, which is, it brings a lot of controversies to surface. But it was striking to me this year that uh, a very strong outside impartial observer looking at that, an agency that actually is tasked with analyzing all healthcare proposals, taking a peek at what was the big proposed single payer bill, which actually did not advance this year, remarked that they were a little worried that all of the alleged savings that are supposed to arise from a single payer system cutting out all kinds of other people was at risk of failing to del deliver on its expectations because it did not have anti-fraud provisions. So I think an issue like uh, this particular thing, auto insurance, fraud act, a very basic thing, but it, it, it plays such an important role ultimately in maintaining an affordable auto insurance marketplace. It's true across all lines. And uh, the fact that that was seen as a major Achilles heel in single payer because they didn't have fraud rules, it's just terrific we're bringing this forward. It's, it's kind of sticking to our knitting, taking care of business. It's it is kind of low key, but fundamentally important to a sound system. Thank you, Ken. Any other comments from legislators or interested parties on the readoption of this model act? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next one. And that will be the asbestos bankruptcy trust claims transparency model act. It was originally adopted in July of 2017 and will be up for readoption this July. Any comments from either legislators or interested persons on this model? Seeing none, we'll move on to the third one, which is Certificates of Insurance Model Act, uh, originally adopted in November 18 of 2012, uh, readopted again July 15 of 2017. Uh, we have comments on this. Wes, do you have comments on this one? I do, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. We, we would urge NCOIL to, to readopt this model. It's proven to be very uh, successful and, and helpful. Um, when I last checked, and it's been a few months, there were over 40 states that had adopted some form of legislation based in significant part on the NCOIL model. And in the five years since it was last adopted, there have been states that have still periodically uh, looked at this as a model. West Virginia, Tennessee come to mind. Colorado is looking at something similar right now. So it it continues to remain relevant uh, and important. So we'd urge uh, re-adoption in the summer. Thanks. Thank you, Wes. Any other comments on this model? Seeing none, the fourth one will be uh, Travel Insurance Model Act, originally adopted November of 2012, uh, an updated version uh, adopted March of 2017, and then an amended version adopted in July of 2017. <clears throat> Do we have comments uh, on the Travel Insurance Model Act. Good morning. This is Duke Jahad from Allianz. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, I apologize. I'm in the car, so I apologize for the noise. I'll keep it brief. Um, Allianz and the USTIA are very supportive of this model and its readoption. Um, NCOIL did great work back in 2016, 2017 to assist uh, everybody, really, the industry, consumers, and regulators with getting some regulatory certainty for this industry, which was under a, a regulatory assault. Um, and since that time, NAIC jumped on after the fact and worked from NCOIL's excellent model and eventually passed the model as well. And we now have been successful in getting this enacted in 27 states including nine this year. So again, I want to thank NCOIL for all the work they did. We know it's a small industry, but, but very important. Appreciate all the work uh, NCOIL has done and support readoption. So thank you. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Any other comments on, on this model act? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to the final one, which is the model act regarding use of insurance binders as evidence of coverage. 
uh, originally adopted July 2012 and readopted in July 2017. It's also up for readoption in there at our July committee meeting. Any comments on this one? All right, seeing none. Uh, we'll move on to uh, our last piece of business before we adjourn. Is as you all know, the registration for the Incol Summer Meeting in New Jersey is now open. And if you haven't yet registered, please do so. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to believe I'll be stepping in, stepping into New Jersey after what St. Peter's did to my Kentucky Wildcats, but I guess I'll make that trip. Uh, but that just shows you how committed I am to the NCOL organization. Uh, you can find <laughs> all the registration information on the NCOL website or by reaching out to NCOL staff. Um, at this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Hey, Bart, I just want to say real quick, I'll hang out with you there because the St. Peter's did the same to my Boilermakers. So. <laughs> I'll take you both over to the St. Peter's campus and show you around. It's about the size of a laptop screen. <laughs> I, with that, I make a motion to adjourn. Uh, second. So second. I have a motion and a second. Thank you all for being here. We are adjourned. <laughs>